morning. So thank you everybody for being here for our CCMP class. First off, thank you for dealing uh, with me last week. Um, I, I don't have the same shirt on. If I do, it's clean, I promise. But um, I was uh, definitely feeling rough last week. Um, so I'm glad to be able to get back together with you um, today and to talk about some of the wireless items. Now I'm going to tell you up front, I am not a wireless expert. Um, I am not an electronics expert, so there's probably some of you on here that know more about electronics than me, and if you do, please jump in and discuss these topics because you're going to know better than me, but um, a good part of this exam is wireless, so we're going to have to discuss the basics of wireless, the basics of modulation, and then we're going to get into Cisco's different setups for wireless. We won't get through it all today, but we'll get through some of it. So we're gonna look at a basic theory and we're gonna look at how you're carrying wireless signals over a data wire or over or basically data over wireless. Um, RF communications obviously is something that deals with um, electric fields, magnetic fields. Um, we all know that RF signals are definitely able to be interfered with with any all different types of things what is what is a very common item that that disrupts rf signals microwaves uh, yeah. microwaves Microwave. big one cordless phones cordless phones anything that creates large electromagnetic fields like i'll give you a great example my dad used to work at alcoa with Alcoa, one of the things they had were these huge pots where they made aluminum. Well, these pots, the way they heated one, heated them is they run a very high electric current through uh, basically anodes and under the bottom of the pots to generate heat. If anybody went into that room with their credit cards in their pocket, it would erase the credit cards. Um, there was that much um, electromagnetic field. In fact, it was so strong the magnetic field was that you could take a shovel and stick it to the pot and it would stand up, it would stick there. Um, so uh, anything that creates large amounts of electricity, uh, ballast on um, lights many times can, can be a problem. Uh, nuclear weapons, EMP, very big thing. I, I had a, a hilarious discussion with my nephew the other day, we were going somewhere and we got talking about AI and we got talking about AI taking over the world and doing robots and all. And he said, well, we'll just hit them with, what's that bomb that creates all the radio waves? And I was like, an EMP bomb? He said, yeah, we'll just hit them with that. And I said, yeah, that would work. I said, but they'll just hide underground and hit us with real nuclear weapons and, and wait us out. But uh, it was kind of funny. He knew what an EMP bomb was. Um, this is the waves from an, uh, obviously from an antenna go out in a spherical shape. Now we'll talk about different shapes because different antennas create different shapes uh, in terms of the way things go out. Um, the further you get from the source, though, we all know that you have a decrease in the amount of signal strength, which typically in our world of networking results in slower speeds, um, not necessarily a drop in complete connection, but a less uh, capable speed. There is a point, though, obviously, where you will completely lose signal. Frequency, and here it is. We have frequency cycle of one signal rise from center line back through the center line. And a hertz is a number of cycles per second. So if we say four cycles per second, so it'd be four hertz. Um, we also talk about wavelengths and um, the distance between uh, the wave and, uh, or the height of a wave in a single cycle. So know that everything is based upon inside of a time frame. So it's something per second or something per cycle that we're looking at. Here's our different frequencies, hertz, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. Um, all of these are different cycles. So up from cycles per second, which is a hertz, to 1,000 hertz per second, which is a kilohertz, to a million, which is mega, to giga, uh, which is uh, was a billion per second. Here's our typical uh, radio frequency that we look at. Um, our most common band that we play in is 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, just recently, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, what is that, 300 gigahertz, I believe it is, that they're going to use for um, low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and it's, there's a, a lot of discussion about it and about uh, what's going to be used to help increase bandwidth for um, cell phones and for um, devices of that nature. 
but we only see a very small part of the spectrum. Um, and we really only have a very small part of the spectrum to play with with wireless, to be quite honest. Um, so we're, we're playing in a pretty small band. The other thing that's important to note is that the channels and the bands are slightly different in other parts of the world compared to the US. I'll give you a great example. Um, I went to, uh, I guess it was, it was Brazil. I went to Brazil and I had an Apple uh, iPad and I had a, an Android tablet. My Android tablet would not connect to the wireless. Um, it just would not shift over to the different channels being used for 1, 3, and 11, uh, or 1, 7, and 11 um, in, down in Brazil, whereas the iPad did switch over for whatever reason. Um, but be aware, we, we've got these two main bands, 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz range. And it's not really just 2.4. It's actually 2.4 to 2.4835. And it's 5.1 up to 5.825. Um, so inside of these are channels. Um, typically, what we try to do is we try to sit on a set of non-overlapping channels. Um, that typically is 1, 7, and 11 for uh, 2.4. Um, I don't remember what it is for 5. Does anybody remember what it is for 5? Nobody. Okay. I do know in Europe, can y'all actually I'm gonna turn my video off, y'all, if that's okay, because my internet connection said it was unstable. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, you're back. You're back now. You were gone a moment. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll turn my video off because it got a little unstable. It may, folks, if it starts raining hard here, I will lose connectivity. Um, that's one of the negatives of Starlink. I do lose connectivity if it rains. It's not supposed to rain hard, but um, it does look like it could rain outside, so just be aware if I drop off, I apologize. Um, I'll try my best not to, but I, I can't control the weather. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, notice that the 2.4 gigahertz band does have 14 channels. Um, we don't typically use all 14 in the U.S., um, and we don't. We usually use 1, 7, or 11 to get away from interfering with one another. Um, the problem is this day and age and it's something that's become a major issue, especially like in uh, if you're renting, uh, say you've rented a, 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 an apartment, there's so many different people using the same wireless channels that you end up with um, problems. Uh, I never even thought about the fact that that could be a big issue because my neighbors are across the road and cows, you know, cows don't usually interfere with my internet very much. Um, but I was teaching a class one time. How many of you have heard of those, um, the networking via the uh, via um, electrical ports? Basically, you connect it to your electrical outlets, and it creates. It actually uses the electrical cables to 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 create a network. Yeah, I have one in my kitchen. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I honestly kind of poo pooed on that and said, "Well, nobody's using that." And I had a student who was actually from New York City. And lived in an apartment in New York City, and he said, "Oh, everybody here uses it." Mm. Kind of wireless brute force, yeah. The Moo export, that's funny. But he said, "Yeah, every everyone in New York uses those systems because there are no open wireless channels. So people have so many wireless devices around that it causes problems." Um, I'm a firm believer in wired. If you can wire it, um, you know, wired cable is always better than than wireless, in my personal opinion, just because it's faster and more reliable. Um, I know there's other people who don't believe that, but that's that's my belief. Um, having said that, we have to have wireless, you know, even though wireless isn't truly wireless. Um, you know, our wireless is access points that will be wired to switches uh, that will be wired to wireless access controllers. So just be aware of that. Here's our different overlapping channels. So you'll notice that typically, even if we're using channel one, there's a little bit of overlap between channel one, two, and three um, automatically. So we actually have to try not to use channels that overlap. Um, it's just, you know, the, the wider the channel assignment, the signals overlap each other, and that can become an issue. So that's why we try to set our devices, or if we end up with multiple SSIDs, 
or multiple different um, areas of wireless, we will try to set them so that they use different channels and won't interfere with one another. I did have an interesting thing that happened one time. The first time I switched over to five gigahertz um, in my house, um, I was using my laptop. I was upstairs doing something. My internet dropped. And I was like, what in the world? And I was trying. I went down, reset the router downstairs, came back upstairs, did all this, and, and it come back up. I'm like, okay, well, it's just a glitch, you know. A um, couple of days later, I'm sitting there, and my internet dropped. I was upstairs doing the same thing with a laptop. And I'm like, what in the world? And I heard, I was listening. I was like, wait a minute, my wife's on the phone. And what was happening was, just so happened, the phones and the wireless five gigahertz internet had got on the same channel. And my wife would call somebody, it would knock off the, the wireless. Um, so I went down and hit the channel button on the phone and made it switch channels and everything was fine from then on. Um, but that was an example of actually running into those adjacent channels causing an issue. Um, looking at wavelength here, measure of physical distance travels in one complete cycle using the Greek symbol of lambda. And uh, RF waves travel at a constant speed, and that is in a vacuum that will travel at the speed of light. Um, in air, it's a little less than the speed of light. Um, one thing that we have learned is that the, the faster the frequency or the higher the frequency, um, the, the shorter the distance it can go. And also, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but the higher the frequency, the less able the signal is to pass through solid objects. I believe that is correct. Correct me if I'm wrong, and if you know differently. Okay. Now, this is something I had to learn, and I still struggle a little bit with the idea of RF power and dB or decibels, um, dB levels. But there is something that uh, power is measured in watts or milliwatts, and it's called an absolute power variable. So there's, in other words, it can fall in a huge range. You don't have to learn this formula, but that is the formula to figure out RF power. What we need to learn is the laws of zero threes and tens. All right. So if a value of zero dB, it means that the two values are absolute are equal. And that means it's a log of zero. Two, two power levels are the same. They have a zero dB uh, relationship to each other. Laws of three means they're doubled, the reference value. So whatever the value is, it doesn't matter if it's a three dB gain, it's double the, um, the, the amount of power. If it's a 3 dB loss, it's half. And then the law of 10 is, if it's a 10 dB gain, it's 10 times the power, whatever the power happens to be. And if it's a minus 10 dB, it's a 10, 10 dB loss, or one-tenth of the, actually it's one-tenth, not 10 dB, but one-tenth of the original strength. So we don't normally actually see the actual strength we measure it in terms of dB. So if you are trying to determine signal loss and you have a zero dB loss, that means nothing was lost, okay? If you have a minus three dB loss, it means one half of the power level was lost in from the sending to the receiver. If you have a 10 dB loss, you only received one tenth of the power that was originally transmitted. And vice versa, if it's a plus three dB, the power is increased by two. And if it's a 10, uh, 10 dB, it is increased by uh, tenfold. Now, this is an example of trying to figure out power levels. Um, so from D to E, it went from five megawatts to 200 megawatts. And so what they teach you to do here is they teach you to use um, the, the three and tens. So, Megawatts D times two times two times 10. In other words, it went up to get to three. Um, it went up double twice and then plus one tenth to get 10 decibels. So it'd be five times two, which is 10, times two, which is 100, excuse me, times two times two times 10, which is 200 milliwatts or 200 milliwatts. So it increased twice and then 10 times. And so it's plus 3 dB, plus 3 dB, plus 10 dB. Um, now, folks, I'm going to be straight up front with you. It's
still don't make a ton of sense to me. Um, but you'll look at it right here. It says you take the, the times two and times 10 operation. So you double five, which is this, to 10, then double 10 to 20, which is our next doubling, and then multiply that by 10 to get 200 milliwatts. And that gives you a doubling, a doubling, and a 10 time increase to get 16 dB gain between those two. You need to know the rules of threes and tens. Um, it's going to show up somewhere. So know the rules of threes and tens. And it does make sense when you look at it like this. I'm going from a five milliwatt to a 200 milliwatt. It means it doubled twice and then increased by tenfold. So five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 times 10 gives you 200 milliwatts. Now, if you really wanted to, you could use the whole formula. Okay. And this is actually the formula to get the net loss between two devices. All right. Or get the actual strength between two different devices, between the, the receiver and the transmitter. Um, this DB formula has the D, uh, DB equals 10 times log 10 of this milliwatt divided by 100 milliwatt equals minus 65 dB. Uh, thankfully, we have programs that do this for us. We plug the numbers in and they'll do it for us. Um, but we also can look at it like this. We got 20 dB at the transmitter. We lose 65 dB. That means that the receiver, we're at minus 45 dB, dBm. Um, and we're going to lose power. Typically, we're going to lose power unless there's some type of um, repeater that increases our power uh, in line. But our typical thing is we're going to lose power between the transmitter and the receiver because we lose power for any time we propagate along a cable, any time we go across an antenna, any time we go across in the atmosphere itself, we're going to lose power. Um, so it's just a, a function of, of it happens. The other thing that can be a problem is the types of connectors that are used um, on our antennas. Um, and, you know, high quality connectors versus low quality, whether or not they're connected well, um, all those things can cause a problem. And cable vendors will even tell you the loss in dB per foot or meter of cable length. So one of the things that's important is if you have a transmitter going up to an antenna, the longer the link is from the transmitter to the antenna, the more loss that's going to actually put into the system. So you need to be aware of that. Um, here again, you'll notice here's a, another example of trying to find the entire measuring power changes across the signal to get what's called the effective isotropic radiated power. In other words, we started with 100 milliwatts, which uh, was 10 dB, 20 dBm. We lost 2 dB because of the cable. We gained 4 dBi isotropic because of the antenna. Some antennas can actually increase the signal strength, so we get that. We lost 69 dB in transmit. We gained another 4 dB by the antenna on the receiving end, lost 2 dB on the cable, and we get a complete uh, 45 dB loss on the receiving end. And that will, pro that will obviously change based upon the atmospheric conditions that are going on um, across those. Um, just last week or the week before, there was a pretty widespread um, outage of um, radio frequency transmissions in uh, parts of Africa and parts of the Middle East due to uh, sunspots on the sun hitting the atmosphere. Um, so those are the types of things that can cause problems. So its amplitude decreases as it travels in free space, even if there are no obstacles. It's going to, to lose because of what's called free space path loss. So important to know that free space, free space path loss is greater in the 5 gigahertz band than the 2.4 gigahertz uh, in the equation. As the frequency increases, so does the loss of dB, which is why 2.4 gigahertz can travel further um, and is um, able to go further and maintain its signal strength, whereas um, 5 gigahertz is not. And that's also why typically, I believe it is 2.4 gigahertz will travel more effectively through 
um, through um, interference or different things than five gigahertz. So we do have a thing called received signal, received signal strength scale. Um, it is a relative value between zero and 255, where zero is the weakest, 255 is the strongest. Um, the problem with RSSI is that uh, different vendors have different ways of actually describing it. Um, and so it is, it is a difficult concept to, to compare between two different vendors. Um, but each receiver does have that sensitivity, and sensitivity level that looks at um, what is being sent. Um, if there's any what's called unintelligible signals, um, and that sensitivity level is when the signal will, if it drops below that level, the signal is unintelligible. In other words, we can't prompt, we can't understand, or the device can't understand what the signal is. So in this case, you'll see an RSSI minus 82 dBMs. Um, if it's below that, then this particular set of equipment cannot understand the signal itself. And then there's also a thing called signal to noise ratio. And that is, um, there's always going to be noise, okay? Uh, RSI is on the signal alone without any other thing coming in to, to interfere. Um, so the difference between the signal noise ratio uh, measuring to be a higher signal to noise is preferred. And that makes sense. Think about it. You want a stronger signal than you do noise. So your signal to noise ratio, higher is better. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on modulation. You don't need to know all this stuff here, but it's just kind of an interesting thing. Um, different modulations such as DSS, direct spread sequence, sequence spread spectrum, or orthogonal uh, frequency division multiplexing are just different ways of taking the information, breaking it up, moving it across multiple channels. Um, this is kind of an important chart to, to at least be aware of. Um, you got A, B, G, or BGA, N, AX, uh, ACAX, and there's even more standards now, obviously. Um, we're getting into, in these upper levels, multiple MIMO, multiple inputs, multiple outputs. So you have multiple antennas so that you can stream multiple channels together. Um, what's the newest standard? I know AX is one. There's a new one that's come out, too. I can't even remember. Um, Wi-Fi 6. A lot of people consider Wi-Fi 6 to be um, similar to 5G or very similar to 5G in terms of the way that it works. But that's what AX is, is Wi-Fi 6. You'll see up to eight spatial streams of up to 1.2 gigabits per spatial stream. Now, will you actually get that? No, but um, you're seeing that we're getting closer and closer with this to the speed of a wired connection. And it's funny because if you'll notice, look at what they're doing. They're kind of doing the same thing that Ethernet did to take the place of token ring. Um, they just throw enough streams at it that it's going to eventually be as fast, if not faster, than gigabit Ethernet. Um, even though they know that you may have eight spatial streams with up to 1.2 gigabits, you may only get 500 uh, megabits per second on each one of those streams. But if you have four of those streams, you're at two gigabits. So it's it's the ability to to basically throw more more width or more um, more bandwidth, really more hose that we talked about in the past, a bigger hose so they can send send things through it, knowing you're going to lose some, but um, just having so many different ways for the data to get there that it's eventually going to be faster. Um, before eight or two eleven in, you had a single transmitter, single receiver. That's called a CISO. Uh, now we have what's called MIMO. Um, we have multiple inputs, multiple outputs. Um, and so instead of having a single transmitter, you have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers so that you can do that multiple spatial streams. Okay. So you'll notice that 802.11, it had four spatial streams. Um, chat here. 802.11BE, Wi-Fi 7. Okay, yep. The six, six gigahertz included by default. The other thing, um, how many of you have seen, let me pull, find me another, give me another thing up here. Um, let's see if I can find the, um, yeah. 
here's one that's got, and they used to have one that looked even crazier. Um, but here's, you'll notice it's got the multiple antennas. Um, well, can't get there. But see the multiple antennas on it. Uh, here's one that's got multiple antennas. So you're seeing the different types of antennas to be able to support. Um, they used to have some really crazy one. They had that one that looked like almost like a, a router. I mean, like a spaceship is going to take off. It was all kind of crazy. Um, but all of that started after 8 or 2, 11. So now you can see up to eight streams. But MIMO is what allows that. And also what they call transmit beam forming. So you can put all the beams together. Yeah, Wi-Fi 7 is rolling out this year. This year roll out, they're working on eight, okay? And what's funny is, is they always, um, Wi-Fi 7 is, or even any of the Wi-Fi, look at this one, this is crazy, folks. Look at that router right there. That's a, and there's a TP. So it does everything. It does A, B, G, N, A, C, the whole shebang. A, X. So it's got every, it's got more antennas than you can shake a stick at. That's pretty crazy. But you understand now why it has all those antennas, because it's got to support, yeah, it looks like an alien spaceship, exactly. But it's also interesting, you know, why, uh, Noval, you mentioned Wi-Fi 7. Now, they're rolling this out, but the standard may not even be finished yet. And we've done that for years and years and years. Like Wi-Fi 8, um, they'll they'll end up with what they call pre-standard pre equipment that they put out. And then they'll patch it to be uh, standardized to, to support um, the equipment. So... And that's the way it's been ever since the beginning of wireless. It's just been a constant battle of trying to to keep up uh, the uh, I trip not I trip Lee, but the EIA TIA is so much slower than um, than the actual vendors putting information out. So they'll get a they'll get a standard. It'll be a base standard. The vendors will roll out all these things. They'll actually get it out into the the wild, and then the IAA TIA will finally approve it. And then the vendors will patch in everything that is they needed, um, so to speak. You'll notice too that as you move further out into the data rates, you use different types of um, modulation and coding schemes um, because as you drop in speed, you're going to use a different coding scheme to make sure you can still maintain connection. Cisco Airlock has 32. That's crazy. That is crazy. 32 elements. It doesn't have 32 on it, though, does it? No, it's just got it. Yeah. A lot of times those are built in and they're uh, they're actually built in directly to the um, into the device and you don't even see them. We'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but this is talking about that very uh, antenna dimensions. These are looking at the antennas for the um, directional ant 25. But you'll notice that antennas have a specific pattern, a radiation pattern based upon azimuth and elevation plane that we will discuss. And when you put these in, when you mount them to the walls, uh, you need to make sure you understand the um, radiation patterns um, so that they will correctly match what you're trying to do in your environment because each one is different. And so with this antenna, you would want to understand the radiation pattern so you know how to, to put it on the wall um, so as to best cover the environment. Okay. Questions about the basics of wireless. So I want to now go into some more detail on how Cisco does this. We're going to look at how Cisco implements their wireless set up and wireless infrastructure. And it's an, it's interesting because we say wireless infrastructure, but it's really not wireless. Um, it's wireless items that are going to be placed onto our wired network. Um, and we're going to probably only get through the APs and w, WLCs today, discovering those types of things. But we'll look at the different types of topologies. Um, the big thing we're going to look at is the difference between um, 
a standalone AP and a uh, wireless LAN controller based AP. So um, in our environments, an access point can be one of two modes. One is autonomous, and that is self-sufficient and standalone. It is also a pain in the rump, um, especially in large environments. If you have 45 or 50 autonomous APs, you're going to want to pull your hair out. All right. Um, thankfully, most APs today are what are called lightweight APs. These APs really depend upon land, wireless LAN controllers for most of the intelligence based uh, behind them. Um, we'll discuss how that works here in a minute, but let's look first at what is an autonomous topology. Now, having said that, not everybody needs a wireless LAN controller. If you've got two, three, four wireless LAN, you know, APs, you may not need a wireless LAN controller. You can go out there and build your network. You can put in four autonomous APs. You can have a couple SSIDs, set up roaming. Everything will work fine for you, all right? So that is one way to do it. Yeah, uh, Bob mentioned something that we'll also discuss, and that is Meraki cloud controllers. Um, there's ways now to use, um, and I use Ubiquity. Ubiquity's got it. Um, I use Ubiquity at my wife's business. Um, so um, there are all types of wireless um, cloud controllers. The problem with some of the Meraki stuff is the second you quit paying, your um, your Meraki APs become can become a brick. Now, we did actually look the other day and found that there is a, a DDWRT um, variety that can be loaded onto a Meraki AP. Um, which I was shocked. I didn't know that was, I know that was not possible at one time, but I, one of my other students in another class found that. Um, so if you quit paying your Meraki um, licensing fee, at least your Meraki APs don't become bricks. They can be loaded with DDWRT. And if you never heard of DDWRT, it is a, uh, a version, uh, an open source AP um, an open source uh, AP software. It can be loaded on just about any type, uh, any device or any router. And so you can see um, there's so many different routers that are, um, let's say Linksys. It shows you all the Linksys devices that are supported. And you can reflash your devices with DDWRT. Um, so what Meraki's got on here. Yep, see there's two Meraki's that are supported. There's a mini and those two. So if you have one of these two, you can actually um, put DDWRT on it. Yep. So um, if you were one of those people who got a free Meraki AP and you've lost your license to it, you may want to get DDWRT and throw it on there and you can start playing with it again. Um, but that is a, a cool little thing. Um, here's an autonomous topology. Notice that um, you basically are creating uh, from your core distribution access, you're creating trunk links. And in those trunk links, you maintain different wireless VLANs and allow those across the trunk links. Um, and it is, yeah, again, it's a little bit of a pain to manage, but in a small environment, it's not that big a deal. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about an autonomous, Cisco. Yeah, yeah, that's true too, uh, Eric. Very good point. Um, Cisco Cat9, and if you've got the Cat, I think the Cat9s that we actually buy through the um, academy will also have that. They have software-based WLC to run on demo license with no issues. Yeah, um, and then you can actually set some of this stuff up. Um, cool thing about the autonomous topology here, you'll notice if two users are actually talking to each other, um, they don't have to go up past the access point. It can actually just go across the access point. The thing here is how often are two users actually talking to each other in a wireless environment? Typically, they're talking to someone upstream. But having said that, it's nice because it's cheap. You don't have to buy a wireless LAN controller to make it happen. Now, Eric, you make an excellent point. We don't necessarily have to buy a physical wireless LAN controller. Now, we can, but there are many different Cisco switches, and there's even ways to run uh, completely virtualized wireless LAN controllers. So when you start looking at the uh, this environment that is the um, autonomous 
excuse me, lightweight AP. Cisco's wireless LAN controllers come in a variety of different forms and functions. Um, so again, you've got all different types of products. You've got physical wireless LAN controllers. You've got the ability to um, integrate them into a 3850 switch. You can integrate them in a 30, 3650 switch. Um, you even got these little mobility, a virtual controller for smaller deployments. So there's ways it's embedded in a very small little controller. And notice that embedded wireless controller can manage up to 100 access points and 2,000 clients. That's pretty darn nice. I mean, that's that's a pretty decent size uh, environment. Go ahead, take the Cat 98 WLC and create a built-in, yeah, and virtual. Yep, they sure have the ability to pretty much load these anywhere. Um, these little ones here are not super expensive. They're pretty easy to actually purchase. Um, the only problem is you'll notice this, the small ones like this have, have uh, end of support date are going at end of sale or in 2021, that's end of sale. Um, so a little bit aggravating that they've done away with these small ones like that, but they've just replaced them with the with this Mobility Express version. Um, but the important thing to note is in a lightweight access point topology, each one of the access points creates a cap wap tunnel, which is basically just a tunnel back to the wireless LAN controller. And pretty much the information that is shared from the wireless LAN controller uh, is sent down those lightweight APs and you do all of your configuration on the wireless LAN controllers and that is pushed out to the APs. Um, the beauty is if you need to do an AP upgrade of the AP software, you can push it all out from a wireless LAN controller. Um, the other thing is the beauty of it, we're going to talk about it here in a second, but you can actually take an AP, stick it in your network, and it has built-in um, capabilities to go find the wireless LAN controller by itself, or you can configure it. We'll talk about that, how it can, you can set a, a primary, secondary, and tertiary um, wireless LAN controller way to look it up. But, okay, no problem at all. Um, but the topologies that are built around this make uh, management of large environments uh, easier. Um, the other thing is that this is called a split MAC architecture. And the important item on that is this. When we talk about split MAC architecture, the AP is handling any of the real-time items needed by the wireless clients. In other words, if it's a real-time item that uh, has to be handled by the AP, that's not going all the way up the cap lap tunnel to the wireless LAN controller. Only management functions are being handled through that cap lap tunnel. So that's what's meant by split MAC architecture, and we'll learn more about that as we move along. A wireless LAN controller, uh, you know, depending on the version, obviously, but can support up 6,000 APs. Um, that's a lot of APs. Um, each AP has its own unique management AP IP address, but um, you'll notice it doesn't even connect with a trunk link to the access layer devices because what happens is that cap wap tunnel is where all traffic is tunneled through. So your VLAN information are, uh, and information are stuck into the cap wap tunnel. Um, you only need an IP address on the uh, AP and that'll be the endpoint for the cap wap tunnel between the wireless LAN controller and the access point. If you move, and we'll talk about much more about the movement between different APs. Um, we'll probably get into, we'll get into that next week. But as you move across, you will associate with different APs. But because all the APs are joined to a single wireless LAN controller, that wireless LAN controller can just maintain that connectivity as the user moves across. Now, there's some... There's some different ways we do that, and we'll talk about that. Um, but basically, with the wireless LAN controller, as the user moves across different APs, they can stay. There, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can either stay in the same VLAN and hand it off, or you can, it depends on where you end up being um, um, rooted to, basically. Are you rooted to your original AP, or are you allowed to move to another AP? All right. One of the things they do mention here is the round trip time between an AP and a controller should be less than 100 milliseconds um, so that you can get almost near real time. Um, and that's something you need to think about in your design of your network. 
make sure you don't have much more latency than that. Um, you also can push multiple controllers further out in the environment if needed. So you can actually put a, a, a wireless LAN controller, instead of having it just in the core, you can push it out further so that it's not, um, here's the example of that here. This is an embedded wireless LAN controller in an access layer device so that you don't have to have that cap wipe tunnel going all the way up to the core layer. Um, and that's, it's, it just makes things faster. So if you're not able to get that 100 millisecond uh, round trip time to your core, you push an embedded wireless LAN controller out to the access layer and that uh, creates a shorter cap wipe tunnel and gives you better functionality uh, for your devices. And that's all they're talking about here too, same thing. Shorter, shorter path through the cap wipe tunnel. Um, you can even go further. Uh, and this is one of the ways that you can actually put Mobility Express topology. Uh, and basically a Cisco AP can run and act as a wireless LAN controller. Uh, this is more useful for small environments or if it's a branch site. Um, and so basically the AP will say, hey, I'm going to be both an AP and a wireless LAN controller. So it's got the functionality built in for both. And it will create cap wipe tunnels, one virtually inside the AP itself between that uh, wireless LAN controller inside of it, the Mobility Express, and cap wipe tunnels to the other APs in the environment that it's part of. Um, Mobility Express wireless LAN controller can support up to 100 APs. So really for most environments, um, that it would work. Those would work just fine. I'm actually gonna stop right here. This is a great place for us to pick up next class, um, the pairing lightweight APs and wireless LAN controllers. So I'm gonna stop right here. Are there any questions about the wireless that we've done so far? No questions? Any questions about um, class itself? Remember, this class is worth uh, a whole bunch of uh, CEUs uh, for you towards your uh, renewing your CCNA or your lower level certification. So um, if you haven't watched that video, go back and watch that video uh, to make sure you, you're, you're able to, to do that. You don't want to lose that opportunity. Okay. Eric, it looks like you may have done... Um, may have worked a great deal with these wireless solutions. So definitely chime in um, and make sure you're you're giving us your information because I've had limited experience with the uh, wireless LAN controllers. And so the, the more folks with experience, the better off we'll be. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna stop the recording.